Father, we thank you for this session. We pray that you continue to endow us with understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, we are looking at the concept of righteousness. The concept of righteousness. Now, um, here we are looking at the nature of God. God is always right and just. God is always right and just. His holy nature is against anything that is evil and sin. So, it's his justice nature, or his just nature, doesn't permit him to behold evil and doesn't permit him to allow evil to go unpunished because of his just nature. You see, his, his mercy uh, allows him to want to deal with sin and help man, but his just nature also demands that sin be punished, evil be punished. In Psalm 97 verse 2, we, we see the nature of God's throne. Psalm 97 verse 2. The nature of God's throne. It says, Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. That when God, God is where, where God is seated, clouds and darkness surround him. And then righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. So anytime God will raise a king, God raises a king to ensure righteousness and justice. In the Bible, throughout the Bible, that was what God said. He told Solomon, he told David, anytime he will appoint you as a king, he will tell you, I've appointed you as a king that you will execute righteousness and justice. So we see a just and righteous God. His righteous nature is that there is no ulterior motive or evil in him. There is no ulterior motive or evil in him. That's his righteous nature. God is holy. God is pure. I mean, he is pure. Then, his just nature is seen in the fact that he will never condemn the innocent and never declare innocent the guilty. So, we should, we should put that in our mind as we understand righteousness. He will never condemn the innocent and he will never declare the innocent guilty. If you are guilty, you will say you are guilty. If you are innocent, you say you are innocent. So in the Garden of Eden, when man sinned against God, man lost the ability to stand before God without any fear, without any condemnation, that something happened, you know, that blocked the flow between God and man. So, for the first time, man ran to hide when they heard the voice of God. Why did they run to hide? Because they were naked. They were naked. But the nakedness was not God's problem because man had been naked all along. You see? So, the nakedness was not a problem. But the problem was the consciousness of their nakedness and the feeling of not being properly clothed before God. That was what sin produced. So they knew they were naked. They had been naked all along, but they now came realizing that they were naked. And they saw that we are not properly clothed before God, before, before a holy and just God. This is what sin did to him, Adam and Eve. So they, they, even when God had not come, they felt the shame. They felt shame even when God had not come on the scene. They felt shame. As soon as they ate the fruit, Adam ate it, they felt shame. And they tried to cover their shame. 
with fig leaves. So let's look at what God did. When God came, God solved the problem this way. Man has sinned. Man is guilty. I must punish sin. I must, because I'm a just God, I cannot overlook sin. So God said, let me take an animal who is innocent, who has not sinned, maybe a lamb, I believe it was a lamb, who has not sinned. Then God took the lamb, and I can almost imagine the lamb protesting, but I've not done anything wrong. <laughs> God said, yes, I know. I know you have not done anything wrong, but I need your innocence for something. So God took the animal and killed the animal. Adam should have been killed, but he killed the animal. You know what he did? So, in a sense, in a, in a, in a figurative sense, the animal now became Adam. You understand? And God killed the animal. Then he used the animal skin to cover Adam. So that when he looks at Adam, he will not see Adam, he will see the animal who was innocent. And the animal that is dead too is Adam. So right in the Garden of Eden, God instituted that this is how I'm going to save man. That was a temporary measure, you know, but that was a measure that also was against the devil to stop his mouth. So one thing that God hates is the, the devil's mouth. Because Satan keeps talking, always accusing and always saying, hey, look, this is it. So God always wants to silence his, his voice. So God said, okay, enough, enough, enough. I'll punish sin. My just nature cannot behold sin. But I'm going to punish sin in a substitute. Because if I say Adam should die right now, if I say I'm going to destroy man, man whom I, I created in my image, no, so let the sheep, the lamb, come and then take the place of man. So righteousness is that which will make a man stand before God without any guilt, consciousness, and any sense of inferiority. That's righteousness. That which can make man stand before God without any guilt, consciousness, and any sense of inferiority. That Adam will not stand before God and feel that he is unworthy to approach God. He is inadequate. That's righteousness is what Adam had that made him have that kind of boldness to engage God even in a conversation without feeling inadequate, without feeling inferior, without feeling unworthy to approach God. So even though God punished them, you know, he, 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 he let them know what their sin will do, the consequences. But um, he also clothed them properly with coat of skin. Instead of the fig leaves that they were trying to cover themselves with, he made coats of skin for them. So this act of God established two facts. First of all, that mankind can never work himself into right standing with God. You can never work yourself into right standing with God. That's number one. Number two, man can only be justified by the method prescribed by God. So, right standing with God and justification can only come from God, not man. That's what it means. What God, what God did. So, if you want to, you want to get to God on your own terms, God becomes angry. That is what we call self-righteousness. When you want to go before God on your own terms, because no human being qualifies to go before God. No human being has what it takes. That's why when Adam sinned, there was no way any human being could redeem Adam. Because 
The thing is, Adam is the first man. Out of him came all mankind. From one blood, God made all men. Acts 17, 26. So that same blood that has been contaminated, who is going to have a different blood to come and redeem man? So there was a problem, a real problem that God had to solve. The one who can take back the authority Adam left for the devil to steal, number one, should be somebody who is man. Okay? Because it is man to man. It is, it is man who gave the authority to the devil. So it is man that must get the authority back, not God. God didn't have dominion over this earth. He had given all dominion to man. So it was man, and man gave it to the devil, and it, it was his right to do so. So another man should be the one who should come and take that thing from the devil. So it, then the man too should not have the contaminated blood that Adam had. Otherwise, he can't redeem. He can't redeem man. So that man, number one, that person should be a man, a human being. Number two, a human being who doesn't have any sin in him. Just as the animal was innocent, that human being should not have any sin in him. Abel couldn't have done it, even though he was a righteous man. Why? Because Abel had Adam's blood. So Abel couldn't have become the substitute for man. Neither could any other man. So God said, okay, the only solution to this problem is when I produce a man from myself and let that man go as man and do everything as man, then let that man die for man. Let that man take back the authority from man. And by so doing, it means that I am correcting the problem that man has created. So God decided to send his son. He was not Jesus to begin with. He was the word, the second person of the Trinity. He was the word. But when he became man, wore a human face, they called him Jesus. And uh, that name was given under heaven, under heaven, for the period in which this whole earth will last, under heaven. See, so, then, before Jesus came, I'll talk about how Jesus came, but before Jesus came, God had to institute a temporary measure. And that temporary measure was that throughout the Old Testament, he told them that anytime the high priest wants to make atonement for you, he should use blood, animal blood. Because that was what he did in the Garden of Eden. And it was a temporary measure. The animal blood was not perfect because it did not have a perfect spirit. You see, human beings are eternal spirits. Animals are not eternal. Animals, animals are, they have souls. They don't have spirits. They are not eternal. I know there are some, some animals in heaven, but they didn't go to heaven from earth. There are horses in heaven. You remember the horse that came, the chariots that came to pick Elijah? They were horses, all right. But they were not horses that maybe went to heaven from earth. They were created for heaven. So they, they, are, they are not like this animal. But animals do not have eternal spirit, so their blood could not do anything for man. So that was a temporary measure in the Old Testament that God instituted. Because without blood, you cannot deal with sin. But Hebrews 10, 4 will tell you that. For it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. It was impossible. So it was just covered. All those in the Old Testament who trusted in the blood of animals were brought into relationship with God. Right standing with God. But they could not come close. 
because of the demands of justice that had not been satisfied yet. And the penalty had not been paid. So they could not just come close to God, but they had a right standing with God. That justified them before God. But that was a temporary measure. Waiting for the ultimate righteousness, ultimate measure that God will fix, which had been fixed in eternity, but you know, had to be revealed gradually. Christ had always existed in eternity, but Christ was released or revealed gradually in time. So even in the Old Testament, they had Christ, but just that uh, he was revealed in sometimes in times. For instance, the uh, Bible says that the rock that followed them was Christ. In the wilderness, the rock that followed them, the rock that they drank from, that rock was Christ. When you read 1 Corinthians 10, it's there from verse 1 to 5. It says, and the spiritual rock that followed them was Christ. The Bible says that Moses, um, he esteemed the reproach of Christ as better riches than the passing pleasures of sin. How did Moses see, see Christ? How did he meet Christ? Most, it was Moses, Jesus was not there when Moses was alive, but Christ was there. Christ was there in a type, and Moses saw the reproach of Christ as better riches than that of the passing pleasures of sin. So, what God did in the Old Testament was he kept giving them promissory notes. It's like somebody is, uh, you are owing somebody. Let's say God is owing justice. And anytime justice will say, I need my money. And God will say, oh, 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 you take this. This is a promise. I will pay. I will pay. And he was always piling those promissory notes. That's what the high priest was doing throughout the Old Testament. Making promises that, oh, I will pay. I will pay. For one, every one year, he will go and do that. Then God, God will tell Jesus, oh, I will pay. You don't worry, I will pay. I will pay. <laughs> so, he too said that, okay. Not until you pay me, I won't let them come. That's why when they died, they were not allowed to go to God. They were kept in Hades. The way into the Holy of Holies was not made perfect. They said, unless everything is paid, you can't, you can't, they can't come to you. But God said, oh, I will pay. So, when Jesus Christ came, he took all the promissory notes. Then, he paid them. Then, he paid for even sin itself, the, the eternal death that is going to come. He went as far as that and paid that one. In Romans 3, 25. Romans 3, 25. It says, verse 24, okay, 23. For I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God passed over the sins that were previously committed. So God passed over them, you know. He couldn't take them away. He just covered them. So in the Old Testament, all their sins was covered. That's why they use the word atonement. The word atonement is the Hebrew word kipu. Kipu, K-I-P-P-U-R. Kipu. It means to cover. <laughs> it can be a nice nickname. <laughs> kipu. <laughs> kipu, kipu. <laughs> and kipu simply means to cover. That's the word atonement. 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 Somebody said atonement means at one meant. To bring at one. But actually, atonement doesn't mean that. I think atonement means to cover. 
So in the Old Testament, God was only covering their sin. That's what I said, promissory notes. I will pay, I will pay. Then Jesus Christ came, and Jesus Christ came to take away the sin. In fact, what Jesus did, let me explain. You know, I said, when Adam sinned, God was in need of somebody as man who would come and uh, pay that price and take that thing back from the devil. The person had to be man. Number two, he had to be sinless. Not the sin of Adam. His blood will have to be pure, not contaminated. So God said, if that's the case, then the only way out, the only way to escape that, because it's also according to the law, when you are in debt, somebody who is your kinsman, your relative, is the one who qualifies to release you. And scripture cannot be broken. That's what God said in the law. Um, let's look at Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24, I think. That was, that was, that was what God said. That kings, king, we, we, we often call it the king's man who will come and redeem you. 25 verse 40. Leviticus 25 verse 47. 40, 47. It says, now, if a sojourner or stranger close to you becomes rich, and one of your brethren who dwells by him becomes poor, and sells himself to the stranger or a sojourner close to you, or to a member of, his, of the stranger's family, after he is sold, he may be redeemed by, he may be redeemed again. One of his brothers may redeem him. So that's that's the, that's the law, and because scripture cannot be broken, there's no way any other person can redeem man or can help man if it is not another man. So God said, "But all men are corrupt now. Then let me produce another man." So all that God was doing in the Old Testament, He was setting the stage for Jesus to come. That was his major concern. That's why in the Old Testament, you see that you, you'll, be, you'll be killing people and all that because he wanted to preserve the line of Jesus so that he, he could come. And anything that will cross his way, he will be very angry and deal with it mercilessly because he wanted to achieve something for man. So um, God said, then the way out is if this person who is coming if he is born by a man, he cannot help but carry contaminated blood. So he said, I would rather let him be born by a woman. He said, I would rather let him be born by a woman. The seed of the, of the woman. So I will name him after the seed of the woman, not the man. Because it was the man who sinned. Because the reason why it was the man who sinned was God, it was the man who received the law. God never told Eve, do not eat this tree. He told Adam. Maybe Adam told Eve. Okay. But the, the, the commandment was directed to Adam. So Adam was the one who was guilty. And number two, the one who carries the gene is a man. The seed is from the man, not the woman. The, the woman only incubates the seed for the man. So if Jesus comes through a man, he will inherit the contaminated blood of Adam. So God said, no. So Genesis 3.15, he said, the seed of the woman will crush your head. You will bruise his heel, but he will crush. You will bite his heel, but he will bruise your head. Not the seed of the man, but the woman. That was when God prophesied the virgin birth. The importance of the virgin birth is that 
it made Jesus qualified to be the one who can save us. Because no man had a hand in his conception. Because if it was Joseph and Mary, even though Joseph was a just man, he was still a contaminated man. His blood was still contaminated. So the blood that was running through Jesus' vein, that blood was not the blood running through anybody's vein. That blood was pure, not contaminated. And science, science has also proven that the baby in the womb, the blood does not mix with the blood of his mother. Yeah, science has proven that. That they come close. There's exchange of nutrients and all that. But the blood will not mix. That's, that's God did that because he wanted a way out so that Jesus wouldn't have to come with contaminated blood. So, you know what? Jesus came as a man, 100% man. All that, the reason why God needed Mary was for Jesus to have flesh. Even the flesh that he had, the body was prepared for him. God prepared the body for him. Hebrews 10. He said, a body you have prepared for me. God had to prepare a body for Jesus. And that body was prepared in a process. I don't have time to t- <laughs> take you to um, how the body was prepared. But let me summarize it. From Abraham, Abraham's work with God, God was able to prepare a body for Jesus. That's why uh, uh, Abraham, you know, uh, the Bible said that Jesus, the son of David, son of Abraham, it was in Abraham's time that God changed the nature of uh, man. You know, when man, man became dust, Adam became dust. You remember, God said, You are dust. And unto dust shall you return. That was Genesis chapter 3, verse um, 19. But before then, verse 14, he had told the serpent, You shall eat dust all the days of your life. So, what, what did God mean by that? So that Adam, because of what you've, you've done, now you have become food for the serpent. Are you following? Because he said, You are dust. And you return to dust. Then he tells this, this one, you will eat dust. You understand? So one man sinned. Man became appointed food for the devil. That's why the devil could put sickness in man's body and all that. He could just toy with man. He became appointed food for the devil. Then when Abraham met God, God did something in Abraham's life that was also like a foundation for the body that he had, hoped, he had prepared for his son. Because Abraham's body was dead. Abraham was dust when he met God. But Abraham had a revelation and that revelation changed his body and in a sense changing from dust to rock all in preparation for the body of Jesus. The revelation was that Abraham saw that he was not only dust, he was ashes. When you read Genesis 18, I want to, uh, let me, I want to touch on that so that you, you follow the story. Genesis 18. When uh, the angels came to God, uh, uh, Abraham, God and the angels came and then they were going. Abraham was talking to God. Then verse 27, he said, Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now I, who am but dust and ashes, have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Now, Abraham, you say Adam was dust, right? Abraham said that I'm not only dust, I'm dust and ashes. What is ashes? Repentance. You see, in the Bible, you say, when you put ashes on your head, it means that you are, you are mourning. a sign of repentance. So God was saying that, I want a, 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 a sample. 
Because God never does anything without, without having recourse to what he has created. Once he created the earth, he never went back to the soil again. He created man, Adam, formed his body. Never went back to the soil again. It was the same body that he used, removed he from, created, from. If it was not formed from the dust, you understand? God took her from Adam. Then from there, human beings came. God never went back, back to the soil. So God is not going to go back to the soil to prepare a body for Jesus. And that body too, they didn't have to contain flesh. So there was a way God had to manipulate and find a means of preparing a body for Jesus without a sinful flesh, a sinful nature. So Abraham, Abraham said, I am dust and ashes. Then as a result of that, Abraham's body was changed. When he met God, God changed his body. In fact, Abraham's body was so changed to the extent that you see, his body was dead. The Bible says he did not consider his body being dead. And Sarah's womb was dead. His body was dead, totally dead. God waited for him to die, for him to die, so that he would not have anything to rely on. Then when he believed God, then the nature was changed. So when you, when you come to Isaiah, look at what Isaiah described Abraham, how he described Abraham. What Abraham did for God, <laughs> nobody has done for God. Sometimes you don't understand when, it's, when God says, this person I love. Two people in the Bible who actually laid a platform for God, for God's purpose to be fulfilled. Abraham and David. These two people, God doesn't joke with them at all because Abraham, God used Abraham to lay a platform of salvation. That he used David to lay a platform of dominion. So Jesus Christ comes to sit on David's throne. Why did the angel tell Mary that he, he will, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David? You understand? He said, uh, did Jesus come to sit on a physical throne? No. He even ran away from kingship. You know, John 6, 15. When they wanted to make me a king, he ran away. But the throne had been built in the spirit by David's obedience. And he came and sat on that throne. And he's still on that throne. And in fact, he will reign on that throne for a thousand years and over when he comes. That same throne. And who built that throne? David. The same thing with Abraham. What Abraham did, it was a platform for God to bring to pass his purpose. Isaiah 51, verse 1 to 2. He said, Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father. And to Sarah who bore you, for I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. Here he's calling Abraham a rock. So now, from dust eh, to dust and ashes, is he called to what? Rock. So now, this is what God achieved. And because Abraham was God's friend, whatever God achieved Abraham, whatever Abraham achieved was for God. That's, that's why God made a covenant with him. Whatever is for me, is for you. Whatever is for you too, is for me. So now that you're my friend, and now you have attained this rock, then let me use this sample too and form a body for my son. So Jesus is rock. Those who are born again, they also become what? Rock. First Peter 2 5. You are living stones, little rocks, being built up into habitation of the spirit. We are living stones, we are little rocks. He said, and I say to you, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. The revelation that Jesus is the Son of God, that's the, the rock I will build a church on. 
So even the church is on a rock. Church on a rock. And so we too, we are rock. Bible said that um, those who believe in my, in my name, they will cast out devils, they will speak with new tongues, they will lay hands on the sea, they will pick up serpents. Meanwhile, Jesus, uh, God told Adam, the serpent will bite you. But why is it that we, we he said we can pick up serpents? Because we are rock. No serpent can bite the rock. You understand? But a serpent can bite the dust. So even physical serpents, we must be able to pick them up. <laughs> yes, physical serpents. You know, I I, say, I took the, I took that I I I went to farm and I, what, what, the farm attendant he was telling me something and I was very sad. He said that we as I was I was following him and I was asking him. He was wearing slippers, chalwati, and I was wearing something else. Then I said, I didn't know no snakes in this area because I was afraid of snakes. You know what he said? He said, oh, once I pass here, no snake can pass there. He said, if I pass here, if a snake comes, the snake will die. He has juju for snake. So I was very sad. <laughs> oh yes, I was very sad. I was sad because Look at this unbeliever. He's not afraid of snakes. He knows he has power. What shows that the juju ju- will work? It's, it is real, and he believes it, and it's working. But me, that the Bible says, I will pick up snakes. <laughs> I'm afraid of the snakes. It's very sad. Okay, so Jesus came. In this, that's why when Jesus Christ came, when he, when he was born, he was man. When he came, he was man. And he, he boasted with the fact that I am man. His favorite title was son of man. Son of man. Don't mess with me. I'm the son of man. You know, because people, people thought that, oh, um, like for instance, Satan said, if you are the son of God, turn these toes into bread. Then Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. <laughs> Satan wanted to put him on a plane of God so that it would be illegal for God to now come and attack me. So he said, if you are the son of God, if he had done that, he would have lifted himself from the plane of man to God. And that would have cancelled his assignment. So he said, son of God, he said, man, I'm only by bread alone. I am man. I'm not son of, I'm man, please. <laughs> I have authority. I am man. Because if you are not a man, you don't have authority on this earth. Because dominion was given to man. Are you following? So if you are not man, you cannot exercise dominion on this earth. That's why in Psalm 5 verse 16, it says, the heavens, even the heavens belongs to God. But the earth he has given to the sons of men. So when he came, he was the son of man. So in John 5, Jesus said that the reason why God has given me the right to execute judgment is because I'm the son of man. Because I'm the son of man. John 5 verse 26 to 27. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. It should have been because he is the, word, the Son of God. But I said, no, authority on this earth is for the Son of Man, the Son of God. So he had to, and he said, Kingsman Redeemer, he has to be our Kingsman, somebody like us, before he can take our place. So he was 100% man. At the same time, he was 100% God. You see, God is wise, and God took the devil, he, I mean, he took the devil in his craftiness. Do you know, you know what I mean? 
He I said, Ozano, you took him. I could yes, we'll be as I say. It's like he has made you a fool. Yes. You think you are wise, but he has made you a fool. I, I was watching this uh, funny clip, and there was there's this comedian called um, Bovi. Bovi in Nigeria. <laughs> then I think he uh, he he saw one lady came to him, and the lady was like, "Oh, man of God, God bless you." <laughs> Have you watched that? Have you watched that before? <laughs> he said, "Oh, man of God, God bless you." Then he said, "No." He said, "Mister, he said, oh no, no, no. Are you the man of God who came on TV? In fact, my husband was blessed. If I want to swear, see, then when he heard that, then he also pretended that it was man of God. <laughs> then he said, oh, God be praised, daughter, daughter, you are blessed, <laughs> daughter, you are blessed. <laughs> you know. Then, then the woman said, so please, this is the seed, and she brought out something, envelope or so, and then she gave it to the man of God." Then he was with a friend. And the friend was trying to tell the woman that she's not a man of God. The friend said, no, it's a mistake. Oh. Then he hit the friend. <laughs> and the friend fell down. And the woman said, he said, no, no, he's under the power, you know. He's under the power. <laughs> and then, then the woman said, can I, can I give you a hug? He said, oh, yes. Then he hugged the woman. No, no, the woman picked his phone. Yes, and then what was in the paper bag was toilet roll. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the, the, the funniest part is that when the woman was going, they said, oh, God bless you. You know, the Bible says that those who give will never lack. And the woman said, where is it in the Bible, please? They said, oh, oh, um, in the book of um, Abraham. <laughs> 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 then he said, I haven't heard that before. He said, oh, yes, you know, there are some scriptures that are taught only in Bible school. So <laughs> you people don't know no scriptures. It's, it's in the New King James Version there, the 20, 2012 edition. <laughs> it's yet to be published. <laughs> so he took, she took him in his craftiness. And God took Satan in his craftiness. You think you are smart. Yet am I, you see me as man. Okay? But I'm also God. Because the one who can redeem man, number one, he must be what? Man. Number two, he must be sinless. No contaminated blood. Number three, he must be able to stand between God and man. You understand? And put one hand on God, one hand on man, and make peace. That was what Job was crying for in Job 9, verse 2. Um, Job 9. Job was crying for that. Verse 33. It says, Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. So the man should be able to stand with one hand touching God one touching man. In, in other words, he must be a God man. When you see him, he's man. Nothing shows that he's not. He's man. At the same time, he's God. So he can stand between God and man. That's the wisdom of God that Paul said, if the earthly rulers had known, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. But God hid it from them. Satan didn't understand this plan of salvation, didn't he? If I if he had understood it, he would have, he would have, he would have prevented Pilate from killing Jesus. But when, when Pilate was killing Jesus, Satan was very happy. You see, you say you are the Messiah, we will kill you today. And he was, he was the one who was instigating people and masterminding all that. He didn't know it, he was working into God's plan. <laughs> Because even if Jesus had wanted to, for instance, when he was before Pilate, he could have, if he had, he had been speaking, he could have set himself free. That's why he was not speaking. Because his words, he could have set himself free. But he had accepted to die. 
he had to die. For this reason he came, he had to die. So, when Jesus died, he was man who had died. So, when he went to the cross, he went to the cross as man. As man. God's perfect substitute for man. That's why when John baptized him, God said, ah, now I have a son. He said, this is my beloved son. He was, he was telling Satan. It was a statement to Satan. I have a son. I have a son. Now I have a son. Son of man. He's on this earth. But he was man. He said, I'm well pleased. Now my, my, my burden is lifted. I've gotten man. That's why we call him the last Adam. He, the first Adam was there. He came as the last Adam. And the last, the last means that there will not be any other Adam anymore. He's the, the last Adam. The second man and the last Adam. So as the last Adam, and as Adam went to the cross, he went to the cross. When he went to the cross, he went there as man. Mankind. You know what he did? Whatever came as a result of man's sin, he was enlarged to engulf all of it. Name it the world. The world that Adam voted into power. The world of Satan. He engulfed it. Sin. He became sin. Sickness. Death. Law, the law, the, the, not the law, the handwriting that was against us, the inscription that were against us. He took all. He was enlarged. Then all was put in him as man. He was man. Then he went and hung on the tree on the cross. Jesus, the, the cross was actually a tree. The Bible calls it a tree. In First Peter two twenty four, he said, "He bore our sins on the tree. On the tree, that's the cross. On the tree, the cross. Now, the reason why it was on the tree was, you know, Adam went to hide behind trees, among trees. But he was exposed before the tree like that. He said, man is no longer going to hide. You understand? He said, man." It's not going to hide anymore. I've come. It's, it's me. I've come. It's like somebody saying, who did this thing? Who did this bad thing? Then everybody's hiding. Then somebody can say, okay, I did this. I've come. Whatever you want to do. We're seeing that. Now, I'm not hiding anymore. I am man. I'm not hiding anymore. I've come. Father, punish me. All that I did, I'm prepared to pay. Punish me. That is why he had to go on the tree, hang on the tree. And he hung on the tree naked. Naked. Do you know why? Because Adam hid even behind the tree, trying to cover. But he hung on the tree. He was stripped naked. The Bible says he was stripped naked. Naked. <laughs> what Jesus did is not a small thing. No. Nobody can act it. <laughs> Even the passion, they couldn't act that part. He was naked. That's why the woman was standing afar off. When the woman was standing afar off, they couldn't come. Only his mother and John were at the foot of the cross. All those other women, Mary, Madeline, they were all afar off. They couldn't watch the nakedness of their pastor like that. I mean, it's, it's, and he was naked. So God made sure that Jesus Christ suffered everything that man should suffer. As a man. All the pains he received, he received as a man, not as God. When they were driving the nails into his hand, it was man, not as God. He, re, he felt the pain. And you know, there were three manner of trees in Eden, and there were three crosses. 
Then he hung on the one in the middle. He, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, was at the center of the garden. The very tree that Adam ate. You know, Adam ate, I don't know the fruit Adam ate, but the leaves Adam used was the fig leaves. Do you understand? The leaf he used to cry was a fig leaf. I don't know whether the fruit too was fig leaf, fig tree. But the leaves that he used were fig leaves. So when Jesus Christ was cursing the fig tree, you know what he said? No man will ever eat fruit from you again. Do you understand? Uh-huh. He said, no man will ever eat fruit from you again. So that should give us a clue. You understand? <laughs> I'm not saying anything. No. <laughs> I'm just giving you some clue. I'm not saying anything. But you see, the, 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 the fig tree, the fig leaf was the one that was covered them. And he cursed the fig tree. So that, look, enough is enough. You are the one who man has been relying on and all that have cursed you. It was a type. He was just enacting it. So he took the place of man. Now, on the cross, all these things were in him. Every bad thing that came through Adam's disobedience, he was made at. That's why God vented his full wrath on Jesus, on the man Jesus who had become Adam's sin. And all this, God made sure that he suffered well, well, well. That was what the justice part of God was saying, punish him, punish him, punish him. And God said, okay, go ahead, punish him, punish him. And they punished him. On, on the cross, he couldn't call God, my, my father said, my God, my God, my God, my God. Why are you forsaking me? Had forsaken him because God was looking at him not as his son but as man. He died in our place. That's why, when he was before he, before he was going to the cross, the covenant, the communion he had with the disciples was a picture. He was trying to tell them that, Look, all of you, you are now in me, and now. I'm going with you to the cross. Because the last sermon, he said, he that drinks my blood and eats my flesh becomes a part of me and I become a part of him. Then he said, this is my blood. This is my flesh. He didn't say, this stand for my blood. He said, this is my blood. This is my flesh. Take ye and eat it. Take ye and drink it. When they did that, he was saying that now he was affirming the fact that all of you are in me and I'm taking all of you to the cross. We are all going to die. So Paul came and Paul said, we were crucified with him. Buried with him. We were what? Raised with him. We were made to sit together with him. So actually, when Jesus was crucified, we were in him. Yes. Because he stood for all humanity, mankind. The same body that he was crucified, the same body resurrected and became glorified. The same body went to heaven. You know what? So now, man is in heaven. Man was not created for heaven in the first place. You understand? But now man can be in heaven because the man Jesus died, rose again. He went to heaven with that same body. The, the same body, you see, when he rose from the dead, the body that was crucified was the body that was raised. But just that it had been glorified. But you still see the wounds. In fact, now even the wounds are still there. They are not scars. They are still fresh wounds. They never die. 
So people who have seen Jesus will tell you that they see that his hand, the wounds in his hand. When he rose from the dead, he told, he told uh, 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 Thomas, reach out and touch me and see, see my wounds. And no, 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 it's not scars. They are still fresh. Always reminding him that he did something. So when he rose from the dead, that was when all angels, all creation, they were so happy. They were so happy. You know what? They were so happy to the extent that <laughs> Bible said that when he rose that morning, there was an earthquake. And the soldiers who were guarding his tomb, they were as dead men. An angels came and then rolled a the stone. He came out. Man had gone through the cycle. Man had been punished. Now man has been restored. So now, God doesn't have a problem with man anymore. It has taken a man to accomplish that on behalf of mankind. So now, the only thing is, if any man wills, let him come. Whosoever believes shall be saved. Now, it's, now, now, it, it, now God is not holding anything against the world. For God so loved the world. By saying, if anyone, anybody at all can come and receive the salvation. That's why if you, are not, if you don't receive salvation, you can't blame God. He's not holding nothing against you. The, the true gospel is to tell people that he has paid for your sins. Come and receive life. That's the true gospel. The gospel is not to tell people that, look, you are going to hell to die. No. He has paid. Come. He has set the table. Come and eat. He has paid the price. Now come and receive the free gift. That's the gospel. And do you know that it's not only human beings who benefited. The creation too rejoiced. Because when Adam sinned, it affected creation and creation was put under bondage. And they were waiting for the manifestation of the sun. Listen on. They were waiting for the day where the true man will come and the man will liberate them from the bondage. So now, when Jesus Christ came and liberated the Christian from bondage, it means that now they are no longer under bondage. So, he said, we must tell the Christian that the price has been paid. That's why I said, go and preach the gospel to all creatures, not man. Mark 16, it says, verse 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature, the animals, the seas, the mountains, preach the gospel to them. What's the gospel? The price has been paid. All things have been reconciled. <laughs> Somebody sent me a message. He said, you know, when we went to with the crusade, then he said, we want to baptize new converts. And there's this river, which is uh, the, the God. It, uh, there's a God in the river. I, I don't know. Do you know that river? Uh, so there's a God in the river, and he said, so can we baptize people in that river? I said, why not? I said, speak to the river and say that you have been reconciled, and therefore I can use you. I said, but if you're afraid, just get a basin <laughs> <laughs> and put water in the basin and baptize them and go, go your way. But if you're not afraid, tell the river that you have been reconciled. The gospel must be preached to them that you have been reconciled. Reconciled. Now, you don't belong to the devil. I can use you. 
I have a friend who um, deals with help, helps, helper, helper medicine. And uh, uh, he, he's a man of God. And it's like he goes and then he gathers the herbs and then he prepares um, things like you can use on your body for skin diseases and other things. Then he told me one day, he said that sometimes when he's going to get the herbs, he will, as he's prepared to enter the forest, he will sense this heaviness. As sometimes he's afraid, he will sense heaviness. And he says that some of the herbalists who are not, who are uh, spiritualists, who are not uh, believers, what they do is that they talk with the, the leaves. Yes, before they are able to do that. Then I said, you two, when you go, talk to the leaves and tell them that Jesus Christ has reconciled you to reconcile all things to God. You are one of them. So allow yourself for me to use you for medicine. And he did it and it worked for him. He said he was surprised. As soon as he made a declaration, he said that everything lifted. Then he went and picked the thing. He was not afraid anymore. Then he did it. So we must preach the gospel to the creation. The creation. David, even David in the Old Testament said, The sons are not smite me. He was talking to the sun. You can't smite me. The moon, you can't, you know, the moon can smite people. You see, when Muslims are having their uh, Rama, um, they are fasting. Sometimes they pray into the moon and the sun. And other people, occultic people, uh, and all those guys, they pray into the sun and the moon, and they use the elements to afflict people. When the moon strikes you, you will get mad. Those who get mad, usually, it is the thing takes place at night. The moon comes at night, and the moon strikes them. That's why we call them lunatic. You know, uh, the moon is called Luna, right? Luna. You know that. So the lunatic are those who have been struck by the moon. So you, the believer, can say, you cannot smite me. You cannot smite me. Talk to the Christian. Start with mosquitoes. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's why I was sad. I couldn't talk to the, the, the snake. Yeah, I should have been able to tell the snake, look, you can't touch me. You have been reconciled. <laughs> <laughs> when we finish, we can go, and go to where the dogs are <laughs> 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 and, 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 t- and, tell, and tell the security, open them, open them. <laughs> you have been reconciled. <laughs> I, 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 was, I, I think I saw this thing uh, I did a cartoon. On. Then somebody was saying that, um, you know, they were going to, they were acting a, a, a film. Then he said, "This scene is that. This scene is, we will open the lion, and then the, he was holding the camera. When you open the lion, he is standing somewhere protected. They say, so we'll open the lion, and the lion will come, but it will not bite you. It will not bite you. That's not the the, the play is that." It shouldn't bite you. So you just open it. To, then he said, but had Lion read the script? <laughs> Is he aware that <laughs> he can't bite you? <laughs> but you know, like, we have examples in the Old Testament where Daniel, the mouth of lions, were stopped. He said, but he, Hebrews says, by faith. He said, by faith, they stopped the mouth of lions. By faith. <laughs> do you know something? They used faith to do those things. It was by faith. They tapped into God's realm. We, as a matter of fact, we are already in God's realm. A lot of the things that we receive by faith, as a matter of fact, we, we have them already. You, you, you use faith for what doesn't belong to you. But certain things have been done already. 
you know, it's all knowledge that we need. So the perfect blood of Jesus came and the perfect blood of Jesus took away our sin. Took away our sin. Took away that, that thing. Now the world, the world too had been crushed. No matter how high the world rises, it can never defeat God's purposes. Do you know why? It has already been crippled. So Paul will say in 1 Corinthians um, 2, the world and the rulers of this world who are coming to nothing, <laughs> they are coming to nothing. 1 Corinthians 2, 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are matured, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. They are coming to nothing means they are coming to zero. Just a matter of time, they are coming to zero. Because the world was nailed to the cross. Everything that Adam, uh, Jesus took the, to the cross, they were killed and they, they were left there. They were left there. The only thing that survived the cross was the life. The life of God. Everything. So John will say that we have overcome the world. Sin has been killed. Sickness has been defeated. Death, yes. Death too has, has died. Death too has been killed. So in actual fact, a time will come where we have believers who will defy death. Break into that realm and defy death. Because the potential is there. That's why even in the Old Testament, they determine when and how they die. Do you know that? What, how did Jacob die? I mean, he, after he had called all his children and blessed all of them, he gave up the ghost. He gave up the ghost. Nobody, he said that, he came out of the body. Moses, if God had not called him, but I would have seen me here. 120 years, his natural force not abated, his eyesight was not dim. 120 years. Then God said, go to the mountain and die. <laughs> so he went to the mountain and then we, like, and Bible said, we don't even know where God buried him. I mean, I believe that he didn't die. You know, he said he died according to the word of God. He didn't die according to death. Are you getting me? Moses died according to God's word. So he wanted, So nobody knows where he was. He was buried. That that's why when uh, yeah, you know. Um, Michael and uh, Lucifer, when you read Jude, he said that Michael and Lucifer had a hot argument over the body of Moses. Yeah, the body. The, the body is very important. Do you, do you know why Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, they all specify where they should be buried? He said, make sure you bury me beside, the, in, in the cave where, and so they took Joseph's bones, they took his bones from Egypt, went to bury him in Cana. Abraham, Abraham bought a, a, burying, uh, a burial site for his wife, and he had to be buried by her. That's where uh, Rebecca was, was buried, Rachel was buried, Jacob was buried. All the patriarchs, they were buried at one place. Yes. He said, make sure you don't bury me here. Take me to the place. Why? They were waiting for the resurrection. When Jesus Christ came and he died, their graves were open. Their, God wanted them to be at a particular place for that to take place. So in the Bible, 
Abraham looking for a burial, a burial site for his wife took about one chapter. Yeah. One chapter. An important subject like born again took two verses. Three verses. But Abraham was looking for a burial site for his wife and that one took a whole chapter. And Paul said that they wanted to be part, part of a better resurrection. The out resurrection. You see, when that one, they wanted to experience that one. When you go to Israel, the saints, um, the, the, the Jews, they want to be buried with their feet pointing towards Jerusalem. So when, when you stand on the mountain, you see their, their barrier, the, where they buried them. You see these small, small little boxes, you know, like caves or something. And plenty of them, all in the center of the, of the, of the city, on, on a mountain pointing towards the city. Could they believe that when they resurrect, they will just have to walk straight to Jerusalem? That's, that's their belief. <laughs> so death has been dealt with. He said the last enemy that will be conquered is death. But actually, death has been dealt with. But you see, the restoration will be in uh, will be progressive. For instance, our spirits are restored first, then our souls are restored, our bodies will be restored when Jesus comes, then the earth will be restored back to paradise, you know, then, you know, uh, death will be dealt with when Jesus appears. Our bodies will change, then we'll, there will be no more death because, we, we, because the, the potential is there. Okay, let's look at so Jesus Christ is God's ultimate righteousness. Romans 8 verse 3. Romans 8 verse 3 to 4. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemns sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us would not work according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So, Jesus became the ultimate righteousness. Now, God's demands for justice had been satisfied in Jesus. So now, if you believe in the finished work of Christ, automatically it means that you were crucified with him buried with him raised with him and you are seated with him so god sees you just as he sees jesus and that is the definition of righteousness righteousness means that god sees you just as he sees jesus because you have believed into him. When we say believe, it's not believing in Jesus. Believing into him. Believing in Jesus simply means that, oh, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. No, no, no. Believing into him means you are trusting him for your salvation. Do you understand? Some people can respond to altar call, but they're only born again. They'll just go and stand there. I, I take you as my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No, no. no. The thing takes place in the heart first. If in your heart you have not believed, you say with your mouth, it's, it's not. So some people can just say, okay, who wants to receive Jesus? You can't, just come. Father, I receive you. I, no. It's with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You believe with the heart first. Then the mouth cannot help but proclaim what their heart has believed. So Jesus is man's, uh, God's ultimate righteousness. Ultimate righteousness. He said God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not in sinful flesh. In the likeness of it. Have you, have you, have you seen it? Yes. Jesus didn't, didn't have sinful flesh. But he came in the likeness. By appearance, you see that he's man. I didn't have man's blood. There was no sin in him. 
Even Pilate, Pilate said, I find no, no cause of death in him. Pilate. <laughs> and yet people said, crucify him. That's why I was talking about Barabbas. Barabbas said, okay. Then he said, we, we don't want him. We want Barabbas. Hey. Then Barabbas was in prison because he led a, a rebellion, a revolt. He was a murderer. When, when you watch uh, Jesus of Nazareth, part, it's part one to part four. That one is very detailed. They show everything, you know, and it, it was very well done. Robert Powell was as Jesus, part one to part, part four. Very detailed. In that movie, for instance, you, you, you see exactly what Barabbas did. He led a revolt. And Bible said that he was in prison because of sedition, a revolt. Met, he murdered somebody, you know, and he was in prison. He had not finished serving his, his sentence, but they requested that he be released and that Jesus will be replaced. So what went into our righteousness, the first one is the principle of substitution. Substitution. He died in our place. He died in our place. That's why I said that the anger that should have come on us went on him. John, John 3.36 3.36 John 3.36 He says He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. See, the wrath of God is not on those who believe in the Son. It's on those who don't believe in the Son. So the principle of substitution means that if it was okay for God to make his Holy Son sin, then it's okay for God to adopt sinners and declare them holy. You understand? It was substitution. He died in our place. That's the first principle that goes into our righteousness. He died in our place. So if it was legal, if it was okay for God to take Jesus, who knew no sin, and make him sin, then it's okay for God to take a sinner and say, I've made him righteous. It's, okay. it, it, it's the same thing. Satan cannot question God. If my own son, who is, not, who is righteous, I've made him sin as he sin. I've made him sin, not a sinner, sin itself. Then I can adopt somebody who is a sinner and call him holy, call him righteousness. So, 2 Corinthians 5 21. I think some of the scriptures I should, just, I should give them to you rather than assuming that. 2 Corinthians 5 21. It says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Yes. Righteousness of God in him. He made him who knew no sin to become sin. That was the substitute. The second principle is the principle of exchange. Jesus didn't only die as our substitute. He also exchanged his life for ours. He took our old sinful nature and sent it to the cross and gave us his own righteous nature. So, principle of exchange. That is why the believer is not only righteous but also holy. The believer is not only righteous, but also holy. I'll talk about that. So, principle of exchange. Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me, and gave himself for me. 
I believe that was what uh, first I was asking that people were saying that then it means that I'm the Holy Spirit. But he said that I've been crucified with Christ. The idea is the self, the old nature, the sinful nature of Adam, crucified with Christ. So we died with him. We were buried with him. Went to hell. Do you know where he was made alive? He was made alive in hell. When he died, because he had been made sin, when he died, when Jesus Christ died, two things happened. Listen, his spirit went to God, but his soul went to hell. So, on the cross, he committed his spirit into God's hands before he died, right? Do you remember that scripture? But then, his soul went to hell because he was made sin. So, in, as Peter said about Christ, that David prophesied about Christ, you will not allow my soul, let me read it, to be in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Acts, maybe chapter 2. Okay. Acts chapter, yeah, chapter 2. Verse 25. For David says concerning him, that's concerning Christ, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He, for he's at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So Jesus' soul went to Hades, hell, and God didn't allow his soul to, um, he, didn't, he didn't leave his soul in Hades. So it was his soul that went to hell and uh, paid the price and all that defeated Satan with us, defeated Satan in hell. When he went to hell, he suffered, because he had gone to hell, he suffered the punishment of man. And because he had gone to hell, the devil thought that <laughs> he, he had gotten him. You understand? Because he went, because he was made sin and he had to go to hell. Because every sin must go to hell. Sinners must, be, must die in hell. So he went to hell. Then when Satan saw that, Satan thought that he had gotten him. In hell, all the demons came and they covered him. Now we've gotten him. Now he's here. He sinned. And he has come here. Now we've got they didn't know that he was he was he was just there as substitute. Come to uh, um, Colossians 2.15. Colossians 2.15. Having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Having disarmed. Other version says, having put off principalities. How did he put them off? They were on him. Or they were all on him, celebrating. We have got him. Then he put them off. He, that was when he was made alive in Peter. Um, Second Peter 3.16 He was made alive in the spirit. Second Peter 3.16 Okay, I think First Peter. First Peter. Um, okay. Yeah, 18 to 19. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Yes. So, he was made alive by the Spirit before he went to preach to them in prison. 
and that was when he was born again. When he died, he died, he went to hell, then he was made alive. That was when he was born again. He, he was born again in hell. He was the first person to be born again. The Bible calls him the firstborn from the dead. The firstborn from spiritual dead, spiritual death. Not the first to be raised from the dead. Lazarus had raised from the dead. Elijah raised from the dead. Jesus himself raised from the dead. But the firstborn from the dead. The first person to pass from spiritual death to spiritual life. Then when he, when he was made alive, then he crossed over to the other side. Hmm? He first went to the place where he had to suffer. Hell. Then he suffered. Then he was made alive. Then he crossed over to the other side, paradise. Then he went and proclaimed to them, it is done. Come, I've paid the price. Let's go. So when he was crossing over from hell to paradise, hell could not stop him. So he said, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades cannot prevail. He was the first member of the church. And if hell could not prevent him from coming, then hell cannot prevent you too. So he crossed over. Then he said, come, David, come. Joshua, all you guys, come. Let's go. It's not your place. Let's go. Because in the Old Testament, nobody could go straight to heaven if only the person died. If only you die, you have to. You have to. That's why Elijah and Enoch, God didn't allow them to die. He just snatched them like that. If, if, if you die, you, 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 you have to go and wait there. I believe that Elijah and Enoch, I believe that Elijah, they will come and die their own death. But, yeah, because in the Revelation, he said that the two things, they came and they died. But I don't know, but maybe. But Jesus, after that, then he took paradise. He took this paradise that was in hell then went and put paradise in heaven. So paradise is in the heavens. It's not in hell anymore. So when believers die, they go to paradise, and the paradise is in heaven. Come to Second, second, second uh, Chronicles. Uh, <laughs> I said Chronicles. Uh, <laughs> Corinthians. Somebody said Cosolonians. <laughs> second, second Corinthians, <laughs> verse chapter twelve. It says, "It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Hmm. I know a man in Christ who, fourteen years ago, whether in the body." I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Such, you know, there are some encounters. It must take you 14 years before you can share. <laughs> Look at Paul, 14 years before you share, you know. <laughs> anyway, I'm not saying you can't share. I'm saying that some encounters, it may take you long before you can share. Then he said, verse 3. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. The things Paul heard, it's not lawful for a man to utter. Heard them in paradise. Do you know that even John the, uh, John the Beloved, the one who wrote Revelation, at a point, he saw seven, uh, the, the, I think the, the seventh angel blew the seventh trumpet, and there was thunder. And the tender, seventh thunder, they uttered some words. He heard the words. He wanted to write. The God said, no, don't write. Supposedly, he went there to paradise. He heard some words. God said, no, don't, don't say it. 
It's not lawful for you to say. He said he was caught up into paradise. So paradise is not down there. When a believer dies, you don't descend, you ascend. But you go to paradise. Paradise is not where, where God is. You see, there are, there are different levels of heaven. Heaven is not just one place. There are different places. Even outer darkness is in the heavenlies. You understand? Paradise is also there. Then the new city is also there. Yeah. But that one will descend. It will descend and come down in the final analysis of things. So, and this, this, this paradise, Paul said, that, that it, was, it was first down. Jesus went there. You remember the rich man and Lazarus, they were separated from, from each other just by a pit. Do you understand? So if this, <laughs> if this hell and this paradise, <laughs> this will be the pit. Which means they are all in the same room. You understand? But when Jesus died, he went there and then took them to, to, to heaven. And the paradise was transferred to heaven. Do you know that when the Garden of Eden, when uh, Adam sinned, okay, what happened to the tree of life? It was still in the garden. So what happened? So now, can we find it on earth here? Could it be that now, it's, some people said that they've discovered the tree of life somewhere. <laughs> I believe that it was transported to heaven, back to heaven. Because in Revelation, the Bible talks about the tree of life on either side of the river of life. So two trees are in heaven instead of one. But it should have been one because on earth as it is in heaven. But when Adam sinned, God took the two, God took the one and transported it to heaven. And now there are two trees of life in heaven bearing how many fruits? Twelve manner of fruits. <laughs> Twelve manner of fruits, one for every month. And the leaves are what? For healing. So when you die right now, you, you are sent. So when he told the thief, he said, Today I say unto you, you will be with me in paradise. The thief didn't go to paradise that day that Jesus died. He didn't say, I say unto you, you will be with me in paradise today. No, he says, I say unto you today. You understand? It depends on where you put the punctuation mark. I say unto you, comma. So, today you will be with me in paradise. It's one sentence. You understand? And I say unto you today, comma. You will be with me in paradise. Because he wasn't going to paradise first. He was going to hell first. From hell, then he went to paradise. So now, there is nobody who is a saint who is trapped under the earth. Hell is beneath. Hell is beneath. But all the saints, they go up there and wait in paradise. All because of what Jesus Christ did. So, he became sin that we might become righteousness. Second Corinthians five twenty one and first Corinthians one thirty. He became a curse, and by the principle of exchange, he made us blessings. Not that we are blessed; he made us blessings. He became a curse. We became blessing. Galatians 3.13 and 1 Peter 3.9 and Ephesians 1.3 He became a curse. Jesus became a curse. Then we have become blessings. So there's no room for curse. Woe has no power over the believer. Evil has no power over the believer. Curse should not affect the believer. I said, should not. 
No room for because if Jesus was made a curse and we have been made blessing, why are we under curse? So it's simply lack of knowledge and revelation that will keep the believer under curse. But never say to yourself that I'm under a curse. Never. You are not under a curse. He took our sickness upon himself and made us well. First Peter 2 24. He said, By whose stripes you were healed. When they laid those stripes at his back, they, he was taking care of our sickness. 39 stripes they gave him, our sickness. But can we still be sick? Can we still be sick? Yes. Sometimes we, we can st still be sick. But can we, still, can we also live in divine health? Yes. So some people who say that, okay, Jesus took away our curse, so no generational curse is, is true. That's, this will answer it. He took sickness too away, but people are still sick. So you see, we have the, the legal aspect of our redemption and the vital aspect, the, the active aspect. That one is appropriated through knowledge and revelation. Then it becomes yours. So if you really know that he has taken my curse, then when you get the revelation, then that curse will live. You will not be under any curse. He was rejected and forsaken by the father to the extent that he couldn't even call him father so that we can be accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1, 6. And he brought us who were afar off near. He brought us into God. So now, Galatians 3.27 says, If you have been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. So Christ is like a robe that you have put on. That is righteousness. So righteousness is not limit, it's, it's not by what you did. It's by what Christ did. You gain right standing before God, not because you did something, but because Christ did something. So God says, you are righteous. You are my children. You are my dearly beloved children. Holy and righteous. Dearly beloved children. Holy and righteous. So let me, I, I want to conclude, but let me talk about holiness. Holiness. We are not only righteous, we are also holy. Jesus did many things for us. If you really understand what he did for us, I mean, our, our praises and, and thanksgiving will never end. Colossians 3 verse 12. Colossians 3 verse 12. It says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Holy and beloved. Ephesians 1.4. Ephesians 1.4. It says, just as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We should be holy and without blame. So, he predestined us to be holy and righteous. He said, beloved, holy and beloved. The word holy, actually, um, when you look at that word, that word the, he, uh, the Greek word is H A 
G I O S O U S Hagios or Hagios, depending on which school you attended. <laughs> <laughs> Every square, the way they pronounce things, you know. If you go to Prempe, they have a way to pronounce things. It was has a different way, better, higher way. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, um, righteousness has been, we have been made righteous, okay, and holy. Now, righteousness talks about the clothes that was put on you. Eh? That was put on you. But holiness is also this. He has changed your very nature. So, substitution and exchange. So, you are righteous and you are also holy when you believe in Jesus. Because apart from putting the garment on you, he has also changed your very nature. We have not just been clothed. Our nature has been changed. Or has changed. Apart from that, the record has been erased. Listen, it's like Barabbas own. He was, if we apply it to ourselves. Okay, we can say that, okay, Barabbas was set free. Then Jesus was arrested. So Barabbas now is free. He's a free man. That's one thing. Number two, in our case, we are not just free. In our case, Barabbas now is changed. He has a different nature. So Barabbas cannot, he, he cannot be called a thief anymore. Do you understand? I'm talking about if he was in our case. The number three, even the record that there was one person called Barabbas who once committed this and was put into prison, that record too has been canceled and erased. That's the power of the death of Jesus Christ. Righteousness and holiness. That's what you see in, 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 in the law, for instance, you remember when Chachuchikata was arrested by President Kufour's government, and he was put in prison. He was given five years, but I think he served only one, 18 months or so. Then he was pardoned by the president before he left office. He pardoned him. When he pardoned him, he came out as a free man. But he said he was going to contest in court again so that they reverse the ruling, so that in the records, there's no such ruling as once upon a time, he was guilty and was now the record will be like he's not guilty, even though he has come out of the prison. He wants to amend the records because maybe who knows? Maybe he may want to stand for president, and you you don't qualify if you have been to prison before. But if they are able to cancel the record, he can qualify. Even though physically he has been there before, the records show that the ruling has been overturned. Are you are you following me? So, righteousness speaks of our clothing, what has been put on us. That is Christ. Galatians 3 27. So, it talks about our acceptability, how God accepts us. But holiness is the nature of God. And so, we don't only have His clothing. We have his very nature. Only God is holy. Only God is holy. In the Old Testament, God never called anybody holy. As in, my, my people, holy. No. Because holiness is for God. But in the New Testament, he didn't only cover us, he also gave us his own nature, which is holiness. So, holiness is like the blood that runs through God. God's own nature. That one too is given to the saints, the believer. 
So we have been born again into the kingdom and we have royal blood. We have not been merely adopted on paper. He gave the place of his son to us in the palace. He gave the place of his son to us in the palace. So we are to him like a son in the palace. On paper, they are, it, 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 has, it has been affected. And in true, I mean, in reality too, we carry his blood, his DNA, his nature. Therefore, the born again believer is a begotten child of God who is in the bosom of the Father. We have been begotten, born, like Jesus was begotten. At one point, he was the only begotten of the Father. Then our first, be, and the later became the first begotten from the dead. But now he is the firstborn among many brethren. Now God has gotten many other sons like him. So he's the firstborn, and all of us too are firstborns. God doesn't have second bones. All of us are firstborn. Why? We are joint heirs. We are joint heirs with Christ. So he's, but he will always be the most important firstborn. But we are also firstborns. First among equals. We are also firstborns. That's why in Hebrews 12, he says to the church of firstborn, of the, and the general assembly, the elect of, we are the elect, elect. Elects. First bones. So, then our spirits are mingled with his spirit in an inseparable union. Actually, when I say his spirit, you see, the one that lives in us is the personal spirit of Jesus, which is his soul. That's the one he breathed into us, which contains his, um, the seed of his, his, I mean, his, his nature, his everything, his DNA and all that. He's the soul of Jesus. Galatians 4, 6 to 7 says that because you are sons, God has sent for the spirit of his son to live in your heart, who Christ Abba Father. So what, the one who is living in our hearts is the spirit of the son, Jesus. He's, he, he's the one who uh, testify that we are born again. Romans 8 9 talks about the same thing. He testifies that we are born again. So righteousness and holiness speak of justification and sanctification, respectively. Justification simply means not guilty. Justification. It simply means not guilty. Somebody has taken your place, so you are not guilty. It's like you owe me, then somebody has come to pay for you. You didn't pay, but I can't come and attack you because somebody has paid for you. <laughs> At the end of the day, the debt has been paid. So you say, not guilty. Or maybe you stole, you stole something from somebody, then the person says, you have stolen from me. I'm going to take you to the police station. Then I come. I say, okay, I'll pay. I've paid for him, please. And he said, then he leaves you to go. Now, you are free, but it doesn't mean that you are not, your, your nature as a thief has been corrected. That justification. But then, what Jesus did, apart from saying you are free, he also changed your nature as a thief. That's sanctification. So, sanctification and sanctification has been accomplished for the believer. So, what Christ did on the cross supplied us with both righteousness and holiness. Both righteousness and and holiness. So the believer is both righteous and holy. You cannot become more righteous or more holy. 
So, I will explain what you can become. Therefore, the Bible says that now we are not just not guilty, we are also born into the royal family with royal blood. That's why we are called saints. The word saint means sanctified, holy, set apart. A saint is not somebody who has died that we pray to. A saint is somebody who has believed into Jesus and he's sanctified, set apart. Throughout, the, throughout Paul's epistle, he calls the believers saints. To the saints. The saints in a, in a, in a, to the saints in Ephesus. The saints in Philippi. The saints, the saints, the saints. Even in Corinthians, that corrupt church, Paul called them saints. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> Paul, was, Paul was speaking to their spirit, spiritual status, not their condition in the, in the natural. He said they are saints. So there's no record ever that we were once sinners. When you become born again, you are a new creation. You don't have any history. Yeah. So, once I was a sinner, saved by grace, once I was a sinner, it's not biblical. <laughs> oh, to tell you the truth, because there's no record in heaven that you were once a sinner. Do you understand? You don't understand? <laughs> you don't want to believe. <laughs> <laughs> there's no record he, he wiped that record because we are new creation the new creation is not the old creation that has been transformed no 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 the new creation is new all things have passed away new brand new like a baby without any history a baby doesn't have any history a brand new baby that has been born fresh what is history what history does he have he has been born. No history. <laughs> so the new creation has no past. It says that all things have become new. All things are gone. All things have become new. Then it says, who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Now that he says not guilty, and he has changed our nature. Who can now go before God and say that I see something wrong with your people? I see something wrong with your children. Nobody. That's why I'm saying that God doesn't, God doesn't have a problem with you at all. The problem is you yourself and me myself. <laughs> For God, come to Romans 8 verse 33. So Satan... Will accuse you, you, you to yourself. He can't accuse you to God. He will come to you and condemn, but not to God. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Then verse 37. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor death nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is Paul giving th this assurance. What can separate us from the love of God? He says nothing. There's also no condemnation. God doesn't condemn the believer. He won't condemn you. Jesus said, where are your accusers, woman? Did they condemn you? 
Say no. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He didn't condemn the woman. He said, go and sin no more. He didn't condemn her. Do, don't, don't do that again. I won't condemn you. So, God sees the believer as truly righteous and holy. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. Truly righteous and holy. It says, And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. The new man is created in true righteousness and holiness. The new man. The new man is a new man. The new man is the believer, the born again believer. New man. Actually, if I decide to go into new man, you will see that it's a church. Yeah. A church is a, is a new man. Corporately, it has been done. So, it's for us. We grow, we put on. We grow into it. We can, it becomes a reality. But the church is also you and I, new man. The, 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 the Jesus Christ is the second man. The last Adam, but the second man. Not the last man, second man. Because the church is also a man. The, the, the maturity of the church is a man, not a woman. <laughs> is that what? More inside. Okay, come to Ephesians 2. So you think the church is a woman, eh? <laughs> anyway, the bride of Christ. You see, what, what actually is happening is that these are all terms that God uses to explain. There are various things of the church. When the church becomes matured, it is a man. I'll, I'll show you. But let me first say this. The bride of Christ, you know, like, now, we are, we, we, are, we are not the bride. Oh. The bride is a new Jerusalem. In Revelation, say, Come here, let me show you the, the bride of the Lamb. Have you seen that, scripture, that verse before? They say, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven I, like a bride adorned for a husband. What is that? That is the church. The saints. But and Paul said, I have espoused you to one man, one husband, Christ, as a virgin. Okay? As a virgin. He was comparing the church to a woman. And he said, Jesus Christ was the church like that. But look at um, Ephesians 2 verse 14. He says, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that's the law of commandments containing ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two. That's making peace. Create who? One new man. And that new man is a church. But the church now, the church now is more like a woman. But she will give birth to a man-child. Listen, no. that man child is a remnant in the church, the overcomers. In Revelation, he said that the woman gave birth to a man child and the child was caught up. Revelation 12. Yeah. And so the man child company, they are the overcomers. They are the people, they are the ones who will enjoy the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So the church is like. Ezekiel said, a wheel in a wheel. A wheel in a wheel. So we have the, the general church, which is the woman. Then we have the nucleus, the man child company, who came out of the woman. One seed bringing forth two people. So we have the wise virgins and the foolish virgins, who are both virgins. Ten virgins, you understand? One is five is wise, five are foolish. The five wise are the ones who enjoy the supper. 
the five foolish went to the outer darkness. But they were all virgins. So if you see the church, everybody who is born again is part of the church, but not everybody is part of the, the, the new man, the man, the man child. It, that's why it's not just a matter of becoming born again. It's a matter of, there's something at stake. That's why the Bible keeps on telling us, grow, grow, work out your salvation, you know, do this, do this, don't do that. It's not, so it's not like, oh, we are saved and all that. No, no, no. We have to be part of the new man, the one new man that he's creating. And that, 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 the man child, I'll, I'll, I'll spend time and talk about that sometime later. I promise to, to do that when we're at um, Asim, but I, I never had the time. But I'll do that. Because in Revelation, you will see the man child, and the man child company, they are the overcomers, the kings and the priests who are really going to live the life. They are sons. The adult part of the church, the mature part of the church, that's a man-child company. That's why Jesus Christ is not the last man, the second man. Another man is coming, who is the new man, the church. But because I'm not talking about that, let me just leave it. Now I've given you some scriptures to just to satisfy you, but... <laughs> <laughs> Later, I will talk about that. So, God doesn't see the born again believer as a sinner. God doesn't refer to us as sinners. He doesn't see. If a, a believer sins, it doesn't make him a sinner. No. And God doesn't call the believer by certain names like thief. <laughs> uh, what what other name? <laughs> Liar. <laughs> what? He said what? Derek. <laughs> you know, God doesn't call us by those names. He calls the believers children, beloved, saints. Do you know why? God always speaks to our potential. That's, that's, how, that's how love speaks. Love speaks to potential, not to situation, uh, to condition. Love speaks to potential. That's why it says, love believes all things. Love hopes all things. You see, love believes. If you love somebody, you, 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 you speak to the person's potential. That's, that's why God's love is unconditional. He, he's speaking, always speaking to our potential, not what we are doing. Otherwise, God will call many. That's why James, James, was, James was angry when they said, you sinners. Purify your hands, you sinners. But God doesn't call the believer a sinner. Now, so the new creation is truly righteous and holy. And the new creation is born from above. Is born from above. Is born from above. Heaven is his home country. Philippians 3.20 Heaven is, in his, heaven is his home country. Philippians 3.20 So, if you are born, born from above, Heaven becomes your, count, your home country. So heaven is not just a place, a place where God didn't save us to struggle to come to heaven. Heaven is not a reward. He has not promised anybody heaven. No. That's where you come from. If we don't understand this, we cannot be effective, effective ambassadors of heaven. Heaven is where you come from, where it's your home country, and you must promote the interest of your home country on this foreign land. This is foreign territory. This world is not our country, even though the earth has been given to man. The government that is ruling the earth right now is not our government. So we are opposition party <laughs> waiting 
for the time when Jesus comes so that our party will be in power. Yeah. So now we are like rebels in this world. That's why I said, don't be like them. Your, your government is not the one in, in power now. If they are governing the power and they are doing, just watch them. Peter said, I beg you, abstain from fleshly lust as pilgrims and sojourners in this world. First Peter 2 12. Let me read it to be sure. The first and second, sometimes they will be confused, so let me just be sure. Ah, I said. Okay, this was, this was right. It was right. First Peter 2 11. <laughs> Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of his station. He said, as pilgrims and sojourners, so this world, our government is not in power. That's why some believers are so funny. They are trying to make this world a better place. That is, that is the slogan of the devil. Satan is the one who is trying to make this world a better place. Make it a better place. Because that's his government in power. But you see, because he has violated the principle of um, without me you can do nothing, he can't put things together. So things are crumbling and things are going haywire. And he, he's, trying to, he's trying to at least create some order so that he can tell God, I'm doing well, you know, but he can't. So when believers are like, we want to make the world a better place, that is the devil's song, Michael Jackson. <laughs> Heal the world. Make it a better place for you and I and the entire human race. Heal the world. Make it a better place. <laughs> Yes. And people like um, New Age people and all that, Oprah, Winfrey, and all, they're all promoting that agenda. Let's make the world a better place so that we, we all live in this world a better place. No, Peter said that we, according to the promise, look forward to a new world wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's when our government will come to power. So we will be calling the shots. So now, in this world, you know what we are doing? What we are doing is we are rebelling against the system. Our candidate has won the election but has not been sworn in. Do you understand? So it's like when we are working, we say, oh, you, I'll give you just some few, few days. We are coming, we are in power. We are now the kingdom. We are now we, are, we have won the election, but just that we have not been sworn in yet. But the day will come when your, your term expires, when the least Adam, God give Adam expires, then our president, our candidates will come. That's when we are going to be in office. Yes. So he will appoint to you, rule over 10 cities. You become the minister of finance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So now, Bible calls this, this present evil age, and we are supposed to walk soberly and righteously in this present evil age. Then we snatch people from hell, promote the interest of heaven, you know. But it's not that we are going to make the world better. So you can you can never you see, no matter how you try, you can never change the kingdoms of this world. Never. There a time will come where our educational system, everything will be based on the Bible. That our constitution will be the Bible. That the whole world, everybody will hold the Bible as the only rule of faith. It won't, it won't happen. But when the next government comes, our constitution is going to be the will of God. Yeah. So now, if you're a believer and you are going to politics and you are saying, oh, uh, you know, Bible says we should let our lives shine. I want to change things. I want to go to parliament and change things. You can't. You can't. The constitution of Ghana is not a Bible. It's not a Bible. 
what we can do now is because we are still in this country right and then we have a kingdom which is in which is which is which has one power by running in power we can command and issue decrees that will affect what they do and change things not necessarily going to power now some believers will, god will put them in politics but it's a calling if you have not been called you will go there and then you will mess up that's why even pastors are going to politics and they are messing up there's one pastor who went to politics and at the end was consulting juju and all that yeah because it's not your field you have not been called to the place it's 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 enemy territory I met one girl, one lady that I taught in Sunday school. And when I met her, she was following one popular actress. So at one camp meeting at um, Indies, I, she was, I, I was just there. I, I saw her pass and I called her. They said, oh, we are, we are going for a trip and we are, going, we, are, we are camped here. We have come to camp here. Then I, she said, oh, I'm following so and so. Then I said, it's not wrong to be an actress, but I can tell you that you must be extremely cautious because you are treading on dangerous ground. You know what? Later, she called me. I gave her my number. I said, you call me. Let's talk. The later she called me and she said, that actress who is a popular actress in Ghana is a lesbian, and one of her conditions is that she will sleep with you before you can follow her. I said, I told you. There are certain places, if you want to go as a believer, you must be stream, you must be extremely cautious and also be strong and also know that that's the calling God has given you. Before you can rise in this world to stardom, you will compromise a lot of things because it's not your government that is in power. So you see believers who want to receive awards like the unbelievers, you can You can never... You can never receive awards. They, can, they will never endorse you like they endorse their own. They can't. They won't. So we should stop, we should stop competing with them. Let the world be the world. Let the church be the church. Simple. We are rebels. Our government is not in power. Okay? We have won the election. We'll be sworn in in January. January 7th. <laughs> but now it's December 15th. You know, and we must tread cautiously to January 7th. Then we can say, aha, now we are in power. He says, he said, for we, he said, now, he said, now we are sons of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. But when it comes, that's when they will see that, ah, these people, they are saints. Because we'll be, we'll be, we'll, we'll be shining and brightening. I'm not saying that don't go into politics, don't go into showbiz, but I'm, I'm giving you the reality. The reality is that it's, diffic- it's very difficult, it's a very difficult and dangerous terrain if that's not your calling. If you want to be mingling with them and all that, you can easily compromise. Easily compromise. Now you see in a church, people are saying that we want to gain acceptance. We want the world to accept us. <laughs> and uh, so we also want to do this and do that. That's why I said the gospel will always be offensive to the world. They can never accept what we do. Never believe what Jesus Christ said. In this world, you have tribulation, persecution. He said, if the world hates you, know that they hated me first. Say they hate you because you are not of this world. You are in the world, but not of this world. God is not bent on reclaiming the kingdoms of this world. So, um, influence. We have to influence society. How do you, you see? How are you influencing society as a Christian? Is it just about dropping one or two ideas there? And no, 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 no. Yours is to win them. Just win them. That's all. Ever since we started talking about that, how much influence have we had on society? Even this country, this country, Christians are 70%, so they say. 
But look at what influence do we have on, on the society. Are we going to come to a point where everybody in this country now is governed by the Bible? No. So let's concentrate on what he has called us to do. Preach to them. Become a witness. Become a witness. Live the life. Become a witness. And then preach to them. But you can never, no matter all the institutions that we have, the kingdom of um, business, commerce, the kingdom of uh, the, the world of um, health, uh, government, the media, and all these things. You see that how the devil has hired them. Even, the, even now, the media. We have Christian media um, outlets, but still, the majority is for the devil. The majority. So, what we do is that in our sphere of influence, then God can reign. So, if something is under your control, then make sure that you institute God's order and allow God to reign. That's why Christians must start uh, uh, building schools. We must encourage Christians to go into education, build schools. Okay? Build schools. No, I'm not saying churches or Christians. Build schools. Then, if you are the principal of a school, you can introduce these things into the school. That's your area of influence. But never think that you can go as a teacher, go to another school, and then you say, I'm going to change GS. <laughs> what they teach. No, no, you can't change what they teach. When you, when you go to, who, who, who has been to a college school before? College school. Yes. They, are, they, are, they have an agenda to change. And you see, they, 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 they try, they try a lot to change. So they will bombard you with all their things, everything. When you go to a Catholic school, they will make sure that you learn Hail Mary, Hail Holy Queen. <laughs> or, yes, you will learn all those things by roots. You memorize them. We used to have RK, religious knowledge, and they would teach us things about the Catholic uh, religion. Make sure that you know. And it was not examinable, like not GC, but you write exams every term. But we knew that it was non scoring because it won't take it to O level. Uh -huh. But you will write exams. So I can recite Hail Mary, I can recite the Apostles' Creed, I can recite up because. They were just teaching us all those things. That's an attempt. So what about if those of us who think that we have, <laughs> we can also go into all those areas. And under our sphere of influence, then God can have influence. But not that you are changing the institutions. You can't. So now, now that we are holy and righteous, what must we do? We cannot be more righteous, neither can we be more holy, but we can be more godly. You see, righteousness is a gift. Holiness is also a gift. But godliness is our gift. Righteousness is from God to us. Holiness is from God to us. But godliness is from us. It's the fruit of our relationship with God. It has got to do with how we must project God's character to all men. That is godliness. So, we don't grow in righteousness. We don't grow in holiness. But we grow in godliness. All that we've said about the righteousness and holiness, they take place in our spirits. So our spirits are truly holy and righteous, just as Jesus before the Father. So before God, we have no problem at all as far as our position as children is concerned. Before God, we have no problem at all. 
But we are charged, enjoined, commanded, and encouraged to exhibit the nature of God and to grow in godliness. That's the part that will attract rewards, not your righteousness. That one, will, you won't receive any reward for that. Because that one, you didn't, that one is just a gift, okay, and, and your holiness. But your godliness will attract a reward. All that God has worked into our spirit, they won't attract any reward in heaven, but what we have worked out of our spirit. So, he says, work out your own salvation. That one will receive a reward. So, 1 Timothy 4, 8 says, we should grow in godliness. We should grow in godliness. 1 Timothy 4, 8. He says, for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is. And of that which is to come. So having promise of the life that now is. And that which is to come. So godliness is profitable. It has a reward. We can grow in grace. And knowledge. Second Peter 3.18 We can grow in faith. Second Thessalonians 1.3 Ever increasing faith. Then we can grow in love. Philippians 1 9. So after God has worked all those things into us, He has saved us, made us righteous, made us holy. I mean, changed our garment, changed our nature as well, removed the scar. Erase the record that was against us, become new creatures and all that. After all that, then we have a responsibility to live a life worthy of our nature and calling. That is what we, we are told to do throughout the New Testament. Live a life worthy of your nature, your, your, your calling and your nature. It's like saying, if you are now uh, you do know that if somebody goes to um, if 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 you you say you are a policeman eh, and you you are a policeman maybe you are wearing the police attire but you're not a policeman but if you say you're a policeman there's something that we expect from you at least you must know certain things true or false yeah <laughs> <laughs> if you are a policeman, you must know certain things about police. You can't say you are a doctor and you are wearing uh, the attire, but you are killing people because you don't know anything about medicine. There was one attendant in, uh, in school who was in our sick bay. We called him Dr. John. <laughs> and he was not a doctor, he was attending to the Metro, uh, is the metro school nurse? And once somebody went and said that um, he has pains in the stomach, and he said um, he has ulcer. Then he gave him Jesse Violet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, Jesse Violet. Say a book concluding. So, if you say you are a doctor, we must we must do certain things about you. So, in the New Testament, we are commanded to renew our minds. Romans twelve verse one. Renew our minds. That one is our duty. How do we do that? Receive teaching. Receive knowledge. As a believer, this, you know, when. Yesterday, I gave you an example of somebody who was translated from Ghana to U.S., but was not changed. That's how the, the Christian is. You have been given a new identity, citizenship, everything. But you must not be taught how to behave like a citizen. That's why we have teachers. 
in the body. You know, what teachers do is that um, the, the apostles create the spiritual um, design, the prophets, the apostles, they lay the foundation, the prophets come and they also um, clear, remove the stamps from the building. The evangelists will go and bring the people from outside then the pastors will come and be healing their wounds, cleaning their wounds and all that. The teachers will come and now teach them how to behave. So they will put food on the table and then teach them how to hold the cutlery, how to eat like a royal. You know, the difference between you and I and then uh, Prince Charles it's because he, he was trained to be a king. I mean, the training they gave him was for him to be a king. To so right from his childhood, I've watched his, um, childhood, uh, his childhood at British Council some years ago. I used to go there, and I watched it. When he was a child and he was crawling, when he was growing, you have all that <laughs> there. And they have training for them. They train them, train them. So right from childhood, he's even taught how to speak. How to speak. Once somebody, the one who was given the commentary said that once he went to school and um, he had a problem with a child, then he was um, like crying. And when they came, they told, when he came, they told him that, look, that child, even his parents, they are under you. Even his parents are under you. That child, even his parents, they are all your subjects. Why are they doing that? They are renewing his mind. He, in fact, he is growing with that mindset. I'm a king. I'm a king. So when I speak, you should obey. Even your father is my subject. Yeah. But when we come to the law, that's what we should also be going through. You are a king. You are a child of God. No, 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 no. This one, it, it's not in our family, please. In our family, they, they will open the family album to you. So have you seen this one? This one is your brother. This one is your uncle. This uncle Peter, this uncle Moses. <laughs> Have you seen? Oh, this um, this uncle of yours. You know, he 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 was put in the lions den, and, and lions could not could not bite him. Say, so, eh? Oh yes, it's in our blood. It's it's something in our blood. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yes, and he's teaching that it's in our blood. It's in our family. The Bible is a book of pictures. So you say, oh, your elder brother is, oh, is Jesus here. Yeah. Eh, yes. He's, he's elder brother. We are family. Members, family members. So that's how you renew your mind. Then you get to a point where you begin to see yourself like that. So Paul will say, little children, no, 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 please. That's not how normal human beings in our family, that's not how they work. We work on two legs. We don't work on four. So don't do this. Work like this. No. If you just say, no, this is foreign to our nature. We don't, we don't commit these things in our family. Have you seen somebody who is working and an adult working with his hand? No, unless he's sick, like he's uh, handicapped. But if he's not handicapped, he will work on two legs. So John was saying that little children, don't copy sin it's not in our nature. Don't copy them. Walk on two legs. So as you are learning to walk, you see, you get up, then you fall. And the teacher will come and hold your hand. No, this are, Then you get up again, then you are going. How, what are they doing? They are training you. That's the reason for church. So we don't come to church um, because maybe it's a social club. We come to church for discipleship, apprenticeship. 
you, have, you, you must have a carpenter who is teaching you how to be a carpenter. You say, come, hold the hammer like this. Sometimes you will hit the nail and then your hand will also be hit. You say, no, you don't do that. Don't do that. Hold it this way. Uh -huh. Hit it. Then you hit it. Gradually. That's what happens when we come and we preach the word of God. So as you are listening to the word of God, then you are getting to know, uh, so I, oh, okay, okay. I now get it. Oh, so you mean, okay, so, so we are a royal family, eh? Okay. Uh -huh. Then it says, present your bodies. Romans 11, 1 to 2. Present your bodies to God as a living sacrifice. Present. So you must do the presentation. Say, uh, now this, this is my body. I've given my body to you. Because one thing that God needs is our body. Because he is not permitted to operate on this earth without a, a human being. Because um, he himself said, let them have dominion. He didn't say, let us have dominion. So he's only man. So God needs our bodies so that he can work through our bodies. The reason why God, God will heal, that he made sure that he healed our bodies was because he needs these bodies of ours. Then present our body parts as instruments of righteousness. Romans 6.13. That is what the saint must do. Instruments of righteousness. Then, 2 Timothy 2, verse 21, purge yourself. The believer is supposed to purge himself. Cleanse himself. Then, 2 Timothy 2, 22, flee from youthful lust. Paul told Timothy, said, flee youthful lust. Because Timothy was a youth. But he was also a man of God, like a, 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 a bishop or no, like um, he was overseeing Ephesus. And Ephesus was not a small town with all these people. So Paul had to give him an exhortation, advice, how to handle old, old, old people. He said that the younger men handle them this way, the older men, you know, rebuke them. Not that because you are the pastor, the old man, you are rebuking them. No, Paul said, no, you have, to, you have to show respect. You have to show respect to them. The elder woman, show respect to them. The sisters, handle them this way, with all purity. Then the brothers too, like that. Flee sexual immorality. First, Corinthians 6, 18. It's also part of how we grow in godliness. Do you know one reason why people do not grow? Because of wrong diet. Because the, the diet we are eating is not balanced. We don't have balanced diet. So you see, you see believers who are koshoko. You know koshoko? Koshoko. Koshoko. Is it, a, is it English? Ga. Chiwe. Ga. Ga. Eh, but I've seen it in uh, textbooks. Biology textbook. Koshoko. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. We got, there's, there's a biology textbook that we used to, that we were using when we were in secondary school. And it was there, Koshoko. It's like, now, Doomso is in, is, is in Wikipedia. Doomso. Yeah. Now it's in Wikipedia, Doomso. <laughs> yes. If you like, you search right now, Doomso. <laughs> That's an achievement Ghana has made. That's our contribution, little contribution we can give me. Was it? An app, do so app. Uh, Play store. So it tells you whether you have light or you don't have light. <laughs> so the, the diet that we 
eat, the food that we eat, plays a very important role. Because see, when you are a baby Christian, you have to be fed with milk. You see, but as you grow, you don't need milk. You need solid food. But it's like uh, there, there are a lot of, you know, as if you have dwelt on milk and milk, and so believers are not growing. The, because the thing is, if you, want, if you don't know what is milk, all the teachings in First Corinthians, they are milk. Spiritual gifts. All that, they are milk. Don't do this. Don't do that. They are milk. Because Paul said, for I, I could not feed you as adults. I fed you with milk because you weren't able to receive. And now you are not even able now. But when you look at Hebrews 5, he said, when for time you ought to be teachers, you have need that somebody teaches you the basic principles of Christ. You have become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For strong meat belong to those who are mature, those who, by, who are of age, who by reason of use have aside their senses to discern between good and evil. Hebrews 5.12 strong meat. If you look at Ephesians, Ephesians was stronger stronger meat than uh, 1 Corinthians. Now Paul was talking about how uh, no, the, the unsearchable riches of Christ in Ephesians. For Corinthians, he was solving a problem. Galatians solving a problem. You know, so Ephesians and Colossians Paul was talking about deeper things. Ephesians was about the mystery of, 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 of Christ, which is his body. And then um, Colossians, the mystery of God, which is Christ. So Colossians was about the head. And Ephesians about the body. And like some of these things. And if you are, are always dwelling on um, milk, milk, milk. How can you grow? How can you grow if you are don't know milk? Then also, we don't also grow because we are not. We we don't look at good examples. We look at bad examples. We are always looking at bad, looking for bad examples, not good examples. <laughs> I remember there was there was a man who used to come to. Uh, the church I was handling at that time and we had uh, in our program we had uh, opening prayer, prayer worship and question time. So question time is like maybe you will come and stand here and say okay if you have questions ask then people will be asking questions for about 30 minutes to one hour. The leader will be answering the questions. Then all his questions that he was asking he was always asking questions like um, okay, so let's let's assume that I'm there, and thieves come to attack me, and I kill them. <laughs> Will I go to heaven? And all that. But you see, the point is that that was very helpful because people come. They, ha- they ask questions and they are being taught and, and it's explained and they are growing. Then we had discussion, bi- Bible studies, where all of us are gathered and we are also going through the scriptures. Then you bring your contribution, I bring mine. That, that ensures growth even more than the preaching. That is very important. The Bible, people sometimes want to miss Bible studies. They want to just enjoy preaching. No. You see, the preaching is more like, um, you know, it's general. The preaching is for the atmosphere, the environment. It's, it's something that is released, you know. But Bible studies is like, it's like rain that falls, you know, little by little. You see, um, when is when, when is we have 
heavy downpour. Then we have the rain that are incessant, like the rain little by little, but the rain for a very long time. Those are the ones that can cause floods in Accra. Yes. And teaching is like that. Preaching is like the heavy downpour. But you see, believers now want preaching more than teaching. And preaching will excite you. We don't, what we need is teaching. You understand? We need teaching more than preaching. A lot of times, when people go for programs and they come back and you ask them what, what was said, they cannot tell you. <laughs> I remember there were two, two brothers that I was in church with them. I couldn't go to church because I had to go and preach somewhere. And even if we had gone for Bible, study, uh, Bible studies, and they said, Today's, today church was so powerful. The message was so powerful. And I was eager to know. I said, so what, what did the preacher say? What did he speak about? He said, oh, you know, we, we can't really buy so powerful. Powerful. <laughs> so I said, ah, okay, so what's the topic? Oh, general Christian, it was powerful. <laughs> they could never even give me one point. Do you know why they said it was powerful? Because the preacher was preaching. Preaching is... I know, like, um, <laughs> yes, it's like, it's like, it's like preaching is, it will, it will excite you. Preaching is good, but we need more of teaching. We need preaching too. Preaching will give, bring you hope, encouragement, inspire you, excite you. You know, take it, take it. I receive it. Jump, I receive it. <laughs> and you know, some people have spe- special skills in preaching. And pre- preaching is a skill you can learn. Oh yeah, you can learn. They have special skills. How they can even preach and whip up your emotions. <laughs> Some people can preach and preach and preach and you will get up, jump and jump here, give somebody a high five, give high five. They get, then you, you see people, they hold their Bibles. Put it on their heads. Yes. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you say, sometimes I want to know what the person is saying, you know. But it's like the way people are even making, you can't even hear. You see, it's like the person is rhyming, rhyming, and people say, "Wow!" <laughs> Why? Where it's rhyming and it's all good. But that's what has caused the shallowness in the church. Believers are shallow. Why? Because we are not grounded in the truth. We have not been, we have not been taught. You see, we have not, we have not been, we have not, Paul said that you should be, you be someone who is nourished up with the words of truth. I remember those days when uh, the late Amwako when we used to go to Santasi for his fellowship, we were children. But I remember those days, people never wanted to miss Bible studies. They would run not to miss Bible studies. And you see, all those Christians at that time, one thing you know about them is that they, they know, at least they know the Bible. Even though there was not much knowledge, most of the things that they knew, it was not uh, like... Now, some of them are revising their notes, but they, they, they know certain things in the, the no Bible. And the, I mean, that, even, that confidence to even open the Bible. And, but now, you see believers, all they know is maybe one thing, and that's all. And maybe, oh, we, we are grace people. We, we are grace. Oh, it's grace, grace. And then all they know is grace. People don't even understand grace. All they say, oh, we, oh I've heard that. Hey, this grace, they are man can bear them. I've, 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 I've heard that. I've heard that now we can do anything. And, you know, they just, and they, that's, that's what they are, they are projecting. Because of wrong teaching, imbalance. If your mother gives you only um, cocoa every day, cocoa, cocoa, 
cuckoo every day. You will not grow well. You need a balanced diet. <laughs> okay. So it says we should purify ourselves. First John 3 3. We should be holy. First Peter 1 14 to 15. Keep ourselves. First John 5 18. Okay. Then um, abstain from all appearances of evil. First John 5. These are all commandments to grow in godliness, how we godly we should become. Cleanse our hands and purify our hearts. James 3 8. Cleanse ourselves from all filth. 2 Corinthians 7 1. You see? Then there are other ones. Come to Colossians 3 12. When you read the New Testament, you, you come across various things that the Bible say that we should do as believers, how we should behave. Even our speech, he said, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. Long suffering. Um, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Let the peace of God rule in your heart, so that to which we are called in one body, be thankful. Okay, yes. Then in fourth six, he said, let your your words, your speech, always be with grace, seasoned with salt. So, growing in godliness talks about apart from um, just keeping yourself pure and all that. We also change our language, our speech, how we, we, we speak. As a Christian, there should be a difference between how you speak, how unbelievers speak. Certain words, unwholesome words, should not come out of your mouth as a believer. Cursed words and profane words and all that, you know. And uh, we, we also, words that will, will kill people's. Spirit, kill their spirit and all that. Then he said we should grow in humility and meekness, long suffering, mercy. These are all godliness. When we say meekness, when we say meekness, meekness, meekness and uh, humility, they are Jesus' trademark. He said. Learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. I am meek and humble of heart. Learn of me. If you look at how Jesus was, he was a very meek person. That should tell you that meekness doesn't mean you don't talk. Jesus talked. In fact, sometimes he was harsh with the Pharisees. And yet he was meek. Look at how children could even come to him and just sit on his laps. Do you understand what I'm saying? When he met the Pharisees, he was so harsh. When he met demons, he was so harsh. But he had meekness. He could descend to everybody. You see, that, that's it. We must, we must ha- ha- pray that God should help us so that we can relate with everybody. Give respect to everybody, even the person is a child. Know how to give respect to everybody. Jesus did that. So children could he could relate with children. He could also relate with Nicodemus and other high high people, you know. But children could also come. He had time for them. You go, Peter and Co said, "No, no, no, head, come, 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 go." They were driving the children away because they didn't see the children as important. But he said, no, 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 please, no. Don't do that. Let them come to me. Don't stop them. They came to him. He accepted them. Then he said, unless you are converted to be like a child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. The one who shows respect is the one who can show respect to a child. Because the thing is, 
you can't you, if you show respect if you show disrespect to a child there's nothing that will happen to you but if you show respect it means that you are respectful if you can humble yourself to somebody who is your equal or somebody who is uh, who is below you then you are truly humble but to humble yourself to somebody who is above you is not humility the reason why I'm saying it's not humility is that it's like, what else should you do? You understand? You understand what I'm saying? The, he's, this, this is your boss. Okay? He's, he has employed you. And he's your boss. I mean, you must humble yourself under your boss. It's part of the rules of the job. Otherwise, he will sack you. But what about somebody who is not your boss, but you humble yourself? To the person, you show respect to the person. That is true humility. Humility is when you are able to lay aside your garment. Anything that makes you, the garment that you are wearing, if you're able to put the garment aside, and don't insist on the garment and you are able to get down and wash people's feet what Jesus did is serious he was serving the disciples serving them washing their feet can you clean the chair for your employees to come and sit down in the church. <laughs> yeah. That's Christianity. Christianity is our attitude towards people. Christianity is not praying in tongues and healing the sick. Those things are good, but our godliness is our attitude. How do you speak to people? Somebody met a pastor for the first time and the pastor didn't know her, but she knew the pastor. And they were meeting for the first time. And he went to the pastor and said, Can I? Oh, no, 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 no. Talk, talk to them. Don't talk to me. Don't talk to them. I don't have time. I don't have time. Talk to them. Don't talk to me. The, the very first time. Then later on, she, the pastor got to know that the person also knew. He's somebody who knew him and the person was quite close. And he was very embarrassed. And the woman said that if, I mean, this, I will not go to this place. We grow in godliness, become like Christ. He said, a smoking flax, he will not quench. A broken reed, a, a, a bruised reed, he will not break. And a smoking flax, he will not quench. It's like a smoking flax. You know, something like a, a, a reed that is on fire, if he blows it very hard, the fire will go off. So he blows it gently. So humility is when you use your strength to help people, not to take advantage of them. You see this Kayoyo power power person, she doesn't know anything. So you you take you heap all this load on her. Then you 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 ignore her. Just one CD. You even bargain with, with her. <laughs> that's that's meekness and humility. Meekness is strength under control. Self-control. He said the meek will inherit the earth. If you are meek, you will inherit the earth. If you are down to earth, you are humble. Paul said, condescend with men of low estate. So, no matter how far removed or apart you are from men, you are able to come to their state, condescend. Of low estate. 
That's humility. People who are employees, sometimes they can't even get on with their em employers, get on with their employees. They can't. Then we come to our attitude towards our, our fellow Christian. I'm talking about growing in godliness. Certain things that you will say whenever you are about to speak, weigh your words and ask yourself, what I'm saying to this Christian brother or sister, can I swallow it back? There are certain words that we should, once you speak them, you see that you can't take them back. So we should be careful how we speak to people. Our tongue should, our, our tongue should be seasoned with salt. Speak respectfully to people. It doesn't cost anything to speak respectfully to people, not harshly. Bitter words. You are a believer. You live with people. You wake up and you frown your face. Your fellow Christians frown your face. You, it's like you, you have done something against me and I can't forgive you, so I must frown my face. When I see you, I'll just frown and I'll just go and all that. When you ask me something, I'll just retort. What do you say? I'll give you cheek. Sarcastic. <laughs> yes, we must learn how to live with people. Those things, these things, we learn them in the Bible. It's not even at home. In the Bible, the Bible is saying that let your see, let your, so don't say, oh, I mean, you know, I didn't have anybody to to teach me these things at home. It's not home. We are talking about Bible, not home. It's church. It's Bible is saying that let your speech be, always be with grace, not home. Some homes don't even, can't even teach you that. There are some homes, the parents will call the children with insult. <laughs> hey, Abu Abraham. <laughs> yeah. So it's not in the home that you get this thing. You get it in the word. As we grow in godliness, it's very important. We must give good account of ourselves. One of the, one of the qualifications of a bishop is that he must, be, he must have good report among those who are not saved. <laughs> is that not interesting? Having good, let, me, let me read that to you. 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy 3. 